So, Lord, we thank you for the word of God, which is living and powerful. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword, Lord. You said, Father, that, that it was able to pierce between bone and marrow, soul and spirit. Lord, you said it was an intention, uh, a, a discerner of thoughts and intentions. And so we thank you today, Lord, that this word will awaken us, Lord. And we want to be blessed by it. So, Holy Spirit, bring revelation to us through it today. And if you agree with that, say amen. So if you were not here over the last two weeks, you can go online and get the message about tithe, offering, first fruit, and also just basically in giving, talking about a set apart something for the Lord, because everything that we do have belongs to the Lord. Proverbs, excuse me, Psalm 24 declares it. It says, the earth is the Lord's, the fullness of it, everyone who dwells on it, whatever we have in it, the Bible declares it all belongs to the Lord. <clears throat> so I was ministering out of it. I don't, I don't have time to go there because I got to really get fast. But but the, the message really came out of Matthew chapter 6 and verses 19 through 21. And it says here, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. By the way, you're getting out of here faster than you know. Like this is just this is just a little quick stop for you to accept Christ and then you go on to ruling and reigning with him. I hope you know that like this is just if you even had a great I hear people say all the time, man, they're 92 years old. So what? Yeah, come on. God bless you. You're 92, but you're going to live to be nine million nine hundred thousand and ninety two years. And then that will be just the beginning with Jesus because you won't be here. So don't focus all your energy, your time, and everything that you do, building up the big houses, building up this. And I know people love to do that because I did it and many of you, you also do it. But the Lord, the, the word says, do not lay up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth, rust are destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there you will also find your heart. And by the way, I'll say this one more time and I'll move on. While you are on this earth, this is where all the decisions that you do need to happen for the Lord. There is no do over. And I will tell you this, if this um, if for some people on this earth who have been lukewarm and not serving the Lord, they will have another opportunity to get it right, but it will be through the seven-year tribulation period, and I am not going to get into an eschatology debate with any of you, but I can sit there and I can show you how the first three and a half years go according to Daniel's book and according to Revelation, <clears throat> the next three and a half years. But you do not want to be here for the back end trying to be martyred to get into heaven. You hear what I'm saying to you? This is where we do it. We get it right the first time because there might not be a second chance. And there is no dress rehearsals. There's no do-overs. There's nothing like that that happens. So this is the place that needs to be happened. Also, one of the things I had brought up and just recapping quickly so I can move into the from the Old Testament to the New Testament is that everything we do in this world is recorded uh, uh, according to Revelation chapter 20. It says, and I saw the books opened and every deed that was done in word that was spoken, we came out of the, the, it's called the book of life. The, And then there was another book there, which is referred to as the Lamb's book of life in the same chapter. The Lamb's book of life is different. The Lamb's book of life records a believer's salvation in the day that they accepted Jesus. So that when we all come before the throne of God, we, it's simple. The book is open. There is your name. Enter in, faithful servant of the Lord. No name, no enter. It's just that simple. I didn't write it. I'm only the messenger <clears throat> of the book. <clears throat> then according to Luke, Jesus writes this in 1915 through 27. We are rewarded, which I just said, for whatever it is that we do. And it has to do with how we will rule and reign with Jesus Christ in the afterlife. Excuse me, I lost my voice during worship. So then last week we went into the Old Testament pointing out many scriptures in regards to the tithe 
and that had to do with pre-law moving into law. And this week, I'm going to focus on tying both the Old and the New Testament together. So once more, let's revisit um, what is the tithe and its purposes. How many of you want to know what is the tithe, what is its purpose, and is it still for today? How many of you would like to know that? How many people, and I will tell you this, I run across people all the time that there's nothing more that they want to know then please tell me it's not for today because I don't want to give up anything that's mine for the Lord. And here's how the Bible works. The Bible allows you to read into it any way you choose to. But the Spirit gives you the wisdom to read into it the way you should read into it. See, the natural man will allow you to look at something. I remember years ago, there was this phrase... And see, on the surface, the phrase went like this. A woman without her man is nothing. I just got the meanest looks. <laughs> A woman without her man is nothing. But just by adding two commas, trust me, if I didn't have my wife, you wouldn't want to know me. <laughs> I would be lost. Um, but here's the way the sentence was supposed to read. A woman, comma, without her, comma, man is nothing. You hear what I just said? A woman without her man is nothing, but saying it the correct way, a woman without her, man is nothing. You see, it depends on what you see when you are reading something. If you read it correctly according to the Spirit, you'll get out of it what you want. And if you're looking for an exit strategy, you can read that into it also. I'm going to give you the truth by the Spirit so that you may grow up and be blessed in these things. So the tithe, for the, for the original intention of the tithe and the offering is simple. First and foremost, it's a portion given from what each one earns or is given. That portion is a tenth. It's what the Bible calls it. With the intention to be set aside for a holy God and his purposes. Historically, it was brought to the tabernacle, and once the tabernacle was no longer, because the tabernacle would be moved from place to place, but then once Solomon built the temple, then everything went into the temple. Then the Bible calls the temple, it calls it the storehouse. Today, that same place is called the church. It is the storehouse. It's what the, the Lord uses. And it can be a tenth part of either in the days of old, or maybe today, if you're just a farmer, and all you do is grow stuff and give it away, this applies to you. If you're a farmer who grows stuff and sells it and makes a lot of money, a tenth of your profit or your proceed is what the Lord is referring to. But it can be a tenth part of agricultural produce or personal income. It's a regular portion you set apart as an offering to God for the works of benevolence or for the support of the church, the priesthood, or for the upkeep of the building. It's a tenth part of whatever comes into one's hands as income or inheritance, whatever you receive. Now, any scripture in regards to the tithe either went to the tabernacle, as I said, and then it became to the temple, and then the temple became the storehouse in there. It was for the purposes of maintaining the temple. Like each month you come in here, we have an electric bill. It's pretty big, right? We have buildings. So it goes to that, and it goes to making sure that we have a mortgage that we're still paying for us to all gather here. And then it goes to um, the worship leader. They get about $100,000 a year each up there. And so I'm prophesying, okay? I'm prophesying, Terry. Say, I receive it, Pastor, okay? I receive it. No, actually, they serve very minimalistically. This church operates very minimalistically in the area of what we pay out because we have so many beautiful servants that give their time to that. But it's for the maintaining the temple, advancing the kingdom, supplying alms to the poor, providing those who are over the house of God and those who itinerated and evangelized the message of the gospel. And you can go back and listen to the message of last week. The reason of the tithe or the set apart portion is so important to the house of God this church because if you were not obedient to that set apart portion we wouldn't be here i mean we don't make hamburgers we don't build cars like we're, we're not selling stuff like we are here to be a service 
for the Lord to the people. That means as this church was started, it was started under the guise of healing, restoration, deliverances, and to minister. And then it had grew into the school in training up, and it became very apostolic in its nature as far as Ephesians 4.11, apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, pastors, evangelists. So it expanded into that, and it keeps expanding. This church reaches places all around the globe every single month through the prophetic teams, through the missionaries that we support, and the people that go out to become a blessing, Ruth and other itinerant ministers that go out there so they can be supported that. Now, because I am such a big proponent and believer in tithing, I have to debate this with people on many different occasions, and I found this out years ago. For those who don't believe, all the arguing in the world is not going to change their mind. And for those who do believe, no information is necessary. They received it by the Spirit, they understand it through the Word, and they just do it. And so I want to do this as I go into finishing up tying the Old Testament to the New Testament to show you how this works. Um, because if you believe that when the Old Testament was over, that everything in the Old Testament was over, I have a, I have a, a news flash for you in that in a minute. But here's the reasons why I, why I normally get about people that do not want to tithe or use a set-apart portion for the Lord. And by the way, when I was a non-believer, I wanted absolutely nothing to do with this. I didn't believe in it. Uh, giving money to it was just, to me, a bunch of hypocrites showing up in a building. And my wife said, come on with me. We could always use another one. And... Uh, <laughs> And uh, so eventually the Lord did. He just, <laughs> he got me on the team. And I realized they're not hypocrites. They're people that really have a purpose and a passion for God. And they love their city and they love people. And they're willing to pray and go into their prayer closet and do things and give where other people would not do that. But these are the reasons why I heard some of them were mine. The first one is this. People will say to me, this is, Pastor, this is the reason why I do not tithe. First of all, I can't afford it. So I always tell people this, first of all, you cannot not afford it. But those same people that I tell this to, they seem to never be able to miss their daily dose of Starbucks, Chick-fil-A, and, uh, and, and uh, Planet Fitness and everything else. And the Bible is clear. It says where your treasure is, that's where you're going to find that person's heart. I don't care about what any of the stuff that you do. Like you want Chick-fil-A and all that doesn't make a difference to me. But for me, it was always about seek first, Matthew 6.33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Do you understand? I was so lost almost 40 years ago. I was so lost that, man, I couldn't believe that I could come and I could find forgiveness because I didn't even want to tell people about the sins, how great they were. I mean, I just thought I'll never have a friend if I tell the people what I actually did. But, man, I was like, wow, Lord. And whatever I could do from that day forward, like I told you this last week, the Lord said, just Treat me like you treated the devil. Give me everything. See, some of you have, you gave the enemy everything, and now you're being stingy with God. Like you spent your paycheck on gambling. You spent your paycheck on pornography. You spent your paycheck on, you know, extravagant eating out all the time or whatever it may be. And then you come to church and you go, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I don't, even, I don't want to make light of it because I get it. But I want you to know this. You cannot afford to not give to the Lord. I've seen the Lord do more with this than I've ever seen him do with people's that. I mean, it's really, and I'll get into that here shortly. Also, I hear people say this, reason number two, it's not biblical. Pay attention today. The only reason why you would not tithe after you hear today is because you just don't want to hear. Number three, they say, well, it might be biblical, but it's just not New Testament biblical. And by the way, have you ever noticed how many people look for ways to get out of this topic? Like, okay, well, maybe you got me there. It is biblical. It's somewhere in there, but it's just not New Testament biblical. The fourth thing people say to me is this. I'm not giving my money to the church. And I'll share this with you real quickly. I felt the same way. And uh, one day, uh, as we were, as when I was saved, giving and, you know, 
cheerfully giving to the Lord each week. You know, the Lord built our business up, and we, you know, we're very blessed. You know the story. And uh, at the end of our juncture at the church we were at for almost 11 years, we would write pretty big checks, right? Because we had, we had the capacity to do that. And I did not know that something was about to go wrong at that church. And we had, uh, they had needed, I think, an air conditioning unit or something like that. And, you know, I looked at my wife and we said, I think it was going to be like back then it was $10,000, which would be like $25,000 today. And I looked at my wife and I said, just write him a check. So we just, we would do this regularly. So we wrote the check for the $10,000, put it in the basket, wrote air conditioning unit on just to help out the church. And we had a lot of members in that church, but I just felt like whatever I can do, Lord, I want to make sure that on this side of heaven that you know, and I'm not boasting. I don't even like to share these stories, just to be honest with you. But to help encourage your faith and be challenged, you know, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God and also by testimonies. That week, something really bad happened in our church. And the whole thing fell apart. I don't want to even get into why. But, you know, sometimes people can make moral decisions that are not good. And uh, we had a pretty good-sized church, and uh, I love that place. You know, it's where I was being trained up. I got, I went to seminary there through a program, a two-year program, where I got my associate's degree in theology, and I went to, you know, this and training there, and lots of things. And uh, I, But the main thing was I wanted to be the best servant. And so when I wrote that check to the Lord, the minute this happened, when this thing fell apart, the first thing I did when I got home, I said, I'm calling the bank and canceling that check. Really, that's what I thought. I'm just going to cancel that check. Stop. And instantly, the Lord said this to me. He said, did you give that money to the church or did you give it to me? I hate when the Lord speaks truth. <laughs> I mean, I was like, oh, I gave it to you, Lord. He said, then you just leave that check right alone. That check won in your account. It's for me. I know what you did. I know the heart you gave it under, and I know what you did. So people say it all the time, I'm not giving my money to the church. I want you to know this. You're not. You're giving it to God. Don't ever come in to church thinking, I got to give this to the church because the pastor needs new sneakers. Has nothing to do with me. <laughs> Absolutely nothing to do with me. Here's the other reason. People say, as soon as I get a raise or a new better paying job, I'll start. My answer is this. No, you won't. If you haven't been faithful over the little, you'll never be faithful over the much. You know, people would say to us like this, oh, it's so easy for you guys to give. You know, because we pastored this church and I ran my business, our business, the first 10 years of passing this church, pastoring full time both. People said, oh, yeah, it's easy for you to talk about giving because look what the Lord did with you. But they don't know that we would go months and months and months with, a, with eating pasta with no sauce. Because we didn't have any money, and we're trying to raise our children, and we're young. Ketchup. Ketchup. One day, yeah, and you know what happened? This is really funny, Pastor. We, we were eating spaghetti, which I could eat every day, right? So for like six months, even I was getting burned out with spaghetti, okay? I'm like, Lord, please, can there be something else besides pasta and butter? <laughs> so this family says to us, hey, we want to have you guys over for, church, uh, for dinner, right? I'm like, oh, thank God. I'm going to get a meal. <laughs> I swear I go there and they have pasta. <laughs> and it wasn't even any meat. It was just like pasta with this little like, and I, and I just looked and I was like, so I like, Lord, you really have a good sense of humor, don't you? But you know, he wants us to be thankful over everything, right? And could we be thankful even when we weren't getting, when we, see, like, that's where you're, this is, the, this is the school of learning, right? This is where you learn how to get blessed when you don't have anything. Like, when you don't have a thing and you can turn around and bless people. You know, my wife would drive down the street, grab your mic there real quick. Babe. She would drive down the street when we were living in an apartment and she would be stopping and blessing people that own these beautiful houses. And I'd be like, oh my God, can we stop with this already? I didn't know anything about the Lord. But she was literally prophesying, as she was blessing them, and she would say, Lord, I'm so happy for those people. I'm so thankful for those people. Oh, those people must be so blessed, Lord. They must love you so much. And I would be like, man, I, I, I'm glad the Lord loves them, but he doesn't look like he loves us. 
God cannot bless those that are jealous and envious. That's Could pretty you fix awesome. that mic if you don't mind? I like it. No. <laughs> yeah, it was like the angelic voice of heaven. Say that again. God cannot help. Brent, would you do me a favor, man? Come up here, my brother in the Lord. Come here. I, I, I did, I'm just looking at you back there. I don't even get people to clap for me. What is it, a bear's hat or something here? Brent. Oh, he's here. He Brent, you her. could use this microphone because yeah, I know you like the use bling. Use the bling. All right, so me, Brent, we're like brothers, okay? And our stories are so similar in so many ways. Now, when Brent first came to High Point, can I share the story with you? Okay. So we want to build your faith with this. He didn't even know I was going to do this. I didn't know he was going to do that until the Lord just showed me his face there. He would have been, thank God I didn't tell you. We didn't need ro night at the Roxbury tonight. All right, so um, Brent, when you came to High Point, we had the little building on Westchester Drive. Now, Brent, when he came, he was just coming. I didn't know anything about him. So we came in, you know, you know the story, came in on Wednesday night. We were actually having a leadership meeting. He just, I told him, I said, no, stay. We were desperate for people. I'm like, stay, just stay. You know, Don't you dare leave. So he, 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 he was there. But he had just come from a really devastating experience in his life. And could you share that experience real quickly, if you don't mind? So, um, and I've shared a little bit of this testimony before, but uh, my wife and I went through a huge bankruptcy. We lost our 10,000 square foot house on the beach. We lost our house in Newport. They took all of our cars. They took everything. We came up here and we had a few dollars in our pocket. And, and one hoopty mobile. It was. <laughs> I, I don't think the door closed, Listen, right? Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Vinny, Vinny remember, because this car was worth $400, right? And it was, I had it coat hangers. The, the hood was coat hangers shut. The door would, it had rust holes in it. And it needed to get fixed one day. And Vinny said, Brent, um, it's like $300 to fix the car. It's not worth that much. I said, I don't care, Vinny, fix it anyway. So Yeah, because when that's all you have, you got to make sure that it's still running. So, so we really came here with our clothes, but we knew our house at the beach we, we used to bless people and we had an elijah room and we knew that god was going to do something and he doesn't take you through something to destroy you he takes you through something to build you up you know so whatever thing that the enemy means for harm god's always got good stuff on the other side of this thing we just got to keep serving him and do season we're going to see the harvest amen so so what happened was i didn't know this about brent and um brent then but he was he started sharing me stories about how he was still I think you were still tithing back to your old church. Weren't you doing that when you came or something? You had made a vow. So, so we had a building program at our old church, and we could not complete the building program because our business went south in the middle of the thing. But the Lord told us, complete the building program even if it takes longer than what they had set it out to be. So I told my pastor, we're going to get the thing done. So we kept sewing into that. And then when we got it done, the Lord said, now... I'm like, Pastor Mike, I hate sharing these things, but this is to build your faith. Yeah. Now I want you to sow $1,000 a month into a church building fund on top of your tithes, on top of your offerings, on top of your missionary givings. And I said, Lord, we have nothing. <laughs> right. I, I yeah. don't have anything. I said, but Lord, you bring it in. I'll be happy to do it. So. And that's the first key to being blessed is that there is a willing mind, a willing heart, a willing vessel, the Bible says. So what happened was um, I watched Brent faithfully, like, be, he rejoiced, you know, we had our place at the beach, and uh, we would bring you guys there and stuff like that, and so, you know, and when he would come, he never was like, oh man, how did you get this, and how did this, and, but you were really humble, and you'd go down there, you'd even work, he'd bring, he'd get stuff, like he was a wholesaler, so he would, he'd come to our house in, at the beach, and I wouldn't see him all day. He'd be selling to stuff to stores all day, working hard, trying to make money, doing whatever he needed to do. And then one day, somebody gave him a break and gave you a trail, a tractor trailer load of product, right? Yeah. So uh, this happened, met this guy. He seen a Jewish star on my arm, gave me a deal, threw me a truck, threw me keys, said, I'm going to do some stuff for you because you're Jewish. And, uh, and But it was just a progression of being blessed. But I will tell you this. So since that time, Renee and I have faithfully every month sewing a thousand dollars into a, ex a building fund on top of the other things we do so it's really god doesn't need our money he just needs our obedience he needs our faithfulness and this is what pastor mike is talking about if god says i want you to give one dollar extra a week 
the obedience, the blessing comes from the obedience. It's not the amount of money, it's the, it's the obedience. Yeah, so here's the part he's not telling you. And the part he's not telling you is the biggest part of it all. In his despair, he could have said, we need the money. I can't tithe right now. Uh, what, are you kidding me, Lord? I can't do anything right now. Uh, like it, we, my, we're like on life support. We got to have this money. But he stayed faithful. He kept doing it and doing it. And I watched him. I watched him and his wife and their family. They gave wherever they were. They gave their tithe. They did that plus offerings. And then what happened was after he sold that tractor trailer load of stuff, then the guy gave him two tractor trailer loads and then three and so on. Year, and how many years ago was that now? About 17 years ago? 20. 20, 20 years. years ago. Now Brent owns 250,000 square foot of warehouse space with over how many products? 11,000? Around 11,000 different products that he sells all around the world and makes ridiculous money because he's blessed in everything he does. Now, the money isn't the issue. The issue is that he was faithful over nothing. And then the Lord made him ruler over much. And he's not even where he's supposed to be yet because it's been prophesied over him that they will own city blocks and that he will own an amusement park one day too, right? So I was told that um, from uh, some prophets, Scott and Kathy Webster, you, you would know them, um, that we were going to be given an amusement park. I got that word 30 years ago. And, uh, and I'm like, uh, like a water park. So I'm like, okay. I remember when the 700 Club, remember they shut down the water park. I said, Lord, is that the one I'm supposed to get? <laughs> you know, but listen, you know, you keep dreaming. Yeah. I'm like, okay, Lord, why not? Why not? But you got to be faithful over the little. So when I said this, I, you know, people will tell me this. Well, as soon as I get a raise or I get a better job, I'm going to start giving to the Lord. And I'm telling you this, no, you won't. If you were cheap with nothing and stingy with nothing, you're going to be stingy with a lot. So, Pastor Mike, it really boils down to if you can't give a penny on a dime, you're not going to give 100000 on a million. Come on, brother. You know, so. Come on. But listen, I'd you know love what? To thank, th thank for this house that Pastor Mike and Pastor Debbie, you know, they're always blessing people. They have that anointing for you to prosper. So, you know, we're in a place where they want us to prosper. There's not jealousy. We're not. We want to see each one of you guys prosper in your business, in your families, in your homes, in your ministries. So it's a really good place to be. Amen. Amen. Thank you for letting me do that, brother. Bless you. And then here's the other reasons, and I'll try to, and I'm going to go, I don't even know, we might have to do this another week, it just depends. So people will say, hey, listen, when I, you know, if I get a better job, then the sixth thing is, they always say to me, I want to tithe, but my spouse won't let me. When I was not tithing, what did you do, honey? I tithe. I told the Lord whatever came through my hands, I would tithe on, and I did that. And so never stopped, never skipped a beat. And the Lord, you, it seemed like you had holes in your pocket. Yeah. But when the money came through my hands, God Man, I'll tell you this. I was, I've it. always been good at making money. <clears throat> but pre-Christ, I was really bad at keeping money. When you have vices and you have a lot of things at the enemy, um, your Lord over the Bible says that you make money to put in pockets that have holes in them. Okay. And that's what happens. Go ahead, say it. So I have a really funny story. He would hide money. <clears throat> So that he had I would money. like to, I would, listen, I'd love to go to Atlantic City with all my salesmen. I had 43 salesmen working for me, and I thought I was a big shot. I had brand new Corvette, nice cars. I mean, here we are, suits on in the casinos at nighttime, gambling, and the enemy was stealing every single penny that I had. I'd have to go home and lie and be deceitful and cheat and beg and borrow for her not so to know. So let me finish this. So he would hide money in the house, and um, I'd be praying, and there was something that needed to be done, and all of a sudden I would find the money. <laughs> I would find the money, and I'd be like, and, you know, I was young, gullible, and, you know, and I would say, I found this money today, and, oh, my goodness. We, I, you I was know, like, we where, where, where'd this. you find it? <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't tell me until years ago when he got saved that he actually was hiding that money and God would reveal it to me yeah. and I would find it anyhow and he That was my God gambling was money. I'd, make, I'd, like, I'd win a lot of money that night and I'd have to go hide some and she'd find it. I'm like, so anyway, but listen. Look these, what the Lord has done. <laughs> by the way, I do want to tell you this. You're not going to hear these stories in your average church, okay? <laughs> But these stories will set the captive free 
from every bondage because when you stand in a pulpit and make it seem that you're perfect and you've never done anything wrong, then you will raise up a house of people that will act like they've never done anything wrong and nobody ever gets set free. So the seventh thing people will say to me is this, we're not under the law. I just do whatever the Spirit of the Lord tells me to do. Like we're just little butterflies, right? We just do whatever we want. And it's amazing to me how this principle of this kind of is shocking because the Bible gives us instruction for everything in life, right? Every instruction that you're walking under came out of the Bible. Marriage, forgiveness, love, how to pray when we lay hands on people, teaching, raising children, healing, reading your Bible, fasting, and so much more. But isn't it funny that when we get to the area of money, they just go, well, we're just going to do whatever. Jesus, like, just do whatever you want, man. It's okay with me. I, I don't believe that. I believe that the Bible is very specific in correction and direction for every single area of our life. Thank you for one person. Amen. I mean. <laughs> Here's the other one I get. I can, but I'm afraid to. I'm afraid I won't have enough. Listen, God has not given you the spirit of fear. He's given you the spirit of boldness, love, power, and a sound mind. And it's all about trusting the Lord. I'm going to run through these quick. Um, no one's going to make me give anything to the church. And the Bible calls those people wicked servants. Number 10, it says, I just, excuse me, I just don't believe in it. And I always say this, they don't believe in it until they need it. Now, I will tell you, that, can I take a side note here and just share a little principle of how I pastor and helping people? We are the most generous people, I believe, in, in, uh, on this side of the Mississippi. We help people continually. This church is massively known for its giving and blessing servants all around the, the, this globe. And uh, I have the occasion to have to deal with people because in life, certain things will happen, right? You run into maybe a little bit of a jam, something happens, you lose your job or whatever. And, you know, there's something about our covenant partner class that we come in covenant with people that come in covenant with us. And it's interesting that people that do not believe in tithing will come to church and ask the church to help them out of people's tithing money. And it sounds harsh, but I'm, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be really, really, I'm trying to give you wisdom. How is it that you can ask for something that you don't believe in? How, how, how is that possible? And here's what we do. We actually will help them. But here's what I do after that. I always ask them this question. Have you started tithing? Because if you haven't started tithing as now the minister of the house, I'll take a vote from all the tithing people in the room. If I told you that I was going to take all your faithful tithing money and give it to people that did not care about tithing nor cared about the system, how many of you would say, good idea, Pastor? Raise your hand. You, you would. You would say, that's not being a good steward of what the Lord has. Why don't we teach them how to be, how to be tithers? Why don't we teach them how to be faithful in the little? And we do. We actually have tithing a uh, minute financial sozo for people that are having a hard time we have amazing people in this building that are so good in their finances and they will teach you how to do those things but i have an obligation that if you keep coming back and you keep needing financial help i'm going to do this i'm going to make sure you and your family eat but i can't i can't do life for you you're going to have to trust in the same system that everybody else is trusting in. And that's why Jesus, well, it is Jesus, even in Malachi, Jesus is there. He says, test me and prove me and see if I'll not pour out the windows, open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings upon you. And I'm going to get to that in a minute. Uh, the last three things of this, God will provide through other people. Some people just have this mindset, what's mine is mine. They also have this mindset that what's yours is mine. Now, my wife likes that second one, too. <laughs> she says, true. Here, people will say this, my money won't make a difference. Uh, listen, just tell me about what Jesus said about the widow with the two mites. I mean, that blew Jesus away. He was like, wow, hey, guys, come here. Look at this woman. 
look, you gave out of your abundance, but she gave every single thing that she had. It meant something to Jesus. And then also we give our money elsewhere. I love this one. People will say this, well, you know, we give to a Randy Clark ministry our money. We do this. That's great. When you're, when you're, when you're running trouble, get Randy Clark on the phone. And, I, and I, believe me, he's an awesome guy, so I got nothing. It could be, you know, Rodney Howard, Brian, doesn't make a difference. It could be Benny. I don't care who it is. But, the, but there's something about bringing your tithe into the storehouse because you have a minister and a team of people that are praying over you. They know you. They bless you. They support you. And if you are thinking it's better for me to send it somewhere else, then when you need that, and I do this for people all the time. I'm, I got a lot of mercy. So, like, I know that they are not honoring the house, and I will still sit there with them and encourage them and bless them and teach them. But I pray that they would also come and participate in supporting their house. This is your house. Like, I want this church to be the absolute best church that can bless our society and many other things because we have the, uh, the totality of many givers that come together and do what they're supposed to do. All right, so let's do this. Go with me the last book of Malachi. I'm going to bring this together for you real quickly. Can I just buy five minutes of your time right now? I promise you I'll start a five-minute timer. <sighs> Malachi chapter 3. And I find it interesting that God, he could have spoken anything in the world in closing out the Old Testament. Malachi, which if you're Italian would be called Malachi, um, <laughs> he, he uses this last opportunity. <laughs> okay, next week, no announcements. He could have spoke anything on the planet at, at all, but he zeroes in on this one really specific thing. And I want to start here in Malachi 3, verse 4, because it's so important how the Lord will return. And when he returns, why did he put this right in after his talking about the returning? It says, and the offering of Judah in Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord. Meaning that he's going to say, wow, look at these people. They were such a blessing to me. And he says here, and as in the days of old, as in the former years, and he said, I will come near you for judgment, and I will be a swift witness against sorcerers. Listen, the people of this world that are participating in witchcraft, the Lord is going after them first. He said, and I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers, against perjurers, against those who exploit wage earners and widows and orphans and against those who turn away aliens because they do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. What he's saying here is this, you did not honor me when you should have honored me. He said, for I am the Lord, I do not change. Now, by the way, who is speaking here? Can somebody tell me this? I am the Lord and I do not change. Who's, who does that sound like? God, but who, which God? Like Jesus? Sounds like Jesus to me, because Jesus is all through the Old Testament. He always was and always will be. And here's the reason why I know this is Jesus, because in the next chapter in going into Matthew, which just hang on a second, you'll see what I'm talking about. He says, therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Yet from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from my ordinances and you have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say to me, in what way shall we return? Now, isn't this interesting that this is the discourse going back and forth, the discussion that the Lord is having with his people. And he's saying, well, Lord, how do we return to you? This is going to be a key for you in this place. Verse 8, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me, but you say, in what way have we robbed you? He answers, in tithes and in offerings. He said, you're cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Do you understand that the nation of the United States of America should be sowing into the churches? This was the plan from the beginning, that the nation was supposed to give into the local churches to do the alms and the benevolence for widows and orphans. But they have robbed God. 
You never heard that preached before, I know it. He said, even this whole nation, bringing all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, and you see if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessings that there will not be room enough to receive it, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. See, most of you are just losing money faster than you're making it because your God is not the God that we are reading here today. Your God is the God of the belly, the God of this world, the God of possessions. It's the altars that we talked about earlier that you're serving and worshiping at. He said, let me pour out for you such blessings that will not have room enough for you to receive, and I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake, so that he will not destroy the fruit of the ground, nor shall the divine fail fruit in the field, says the Lord. So Jesus finishes the Old Testament with these instructions, and then he doubles down on the same thing in the New Testament. And I'm going to close here, and I might have to go back another week with this. I don't know. Um, if you would, just jump into Matthew chapter 5 with me. See, the New Testament mindset of many New Testament followers is that, hey, we have Jesus. He's the party guy. He set us free of the curse and the law, and he did. And now we can just do whatever the heck we want to do. But I don't see that in the Scripture. I see a very, very specific formula put together so that God can have people follow a system that would turn and bless them. Can I get an amen? <clears throat> By the way, when Jesus fulfilled the law, he didn't erase it or reduce it. What he did was he spiritually took it and he enhanced it. He was the fulfillment of it. And here's what it says in 517. It says, do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy the law, but fulfill it. You see, and Jesus was having to deal with Pharisees and Sadducees that were standing around him that were arguing with him that he was nullifying the law. Read it yourself. By the way, the word fulfill here that Jesus is talking about means to expand. It does not mean to bring to an end. Jesus says it this way. I didn't come to destroy the law or the prophets, I, but I came to expand it. Read it yourself. Do the study yourself. I did all the work, leg work for you. So how do we, and here's what, he, here's what he's saying. He did not come to destroy the law. And how do we know that to be true? And I'll close here. Because if it was true, what would we do with all the Old Testament prof prophecies that still have not been fulfilled? If the law was dead, when Jesus comes on the scene and he's starting here, the Beatitudes, Sermon on the Mount, if the law was dead, and I'm going to tell you something because I know that, you know, I, there's, there's some people right now, I'm, I'm touching your pharisaical nerve button. But listen to me carefully. If the law was dead, then, the, then everything the Old Testament talked about has already been fulfilled. And if that means it has been, then we're all in trouble. What about Isaiah's prophecies? What about Daniel's prophecies? What about Jeremiah's prophecies? What about Ezekiel's prophecies that still have to come about the coming one? Joel, whoever it is, just list them all. And he says here this, do not think I came to destroy the law. Jumping into verse 18, for surely, listen to this, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or tittle will be by no means passed from the law till it's all fulfilled. Huh. What does that mean, church? See, in essence, we are still between both books. We're between the Old Testament, and though we're in the New Testament, we are between the Old and the New Testament, waiting for Jesus to fulfill all of the prophecies. And then what you'd have to say is this, is that what Jesus said was hogwash in the Old Testament. Well, if it was hogwash in the Old Testament, then, then there is no prophecies to come. Because Jesus just doesn't mess around. He doesn't just call one thing this and then say, ha ha, I got you over here. So before I finish reading this real quickly, I've got 10 seconds. Let me just say this to you. I am not under the law and neither are you. But I'm under grace. 
And Jesus came to set us free from the curse and from the law. Can I get an amen? amen? He became the curse for us, and he hung on the cross for us. True? Amen. But what I'm under, listen to me carefully, Bible scholars. What I am under is under the wisdom of the holy commandments. In essence, I'm pulling from the and kind of from mining out all the gold and the silver that still remains in the Old Testament. And I'm applying those into today in the New Testament. I'm going back to the precepts, the commandments, and all of the ordinances of the Lord. And I'm saying, I'm going to find the good stuff in each one of those. That's what Jesus is saying to do. Just go find the other one. Jeremiah said, look, don't forget the ancient pathways. Right? Don't forget the ancient pathways, church. He said, here's what I'm going to do. I want you to go, like if, if, if somebody dug a mine over here, they might not have been that good. I want you to go and start digging that mine again. There's going to be some stuff in there for you. But only if you believe the one who told you to do it is true, would you do it. Whew, getting quiet in here. 111. Listen, can I tell you this right now? Shoney's is just coming out with the new prime rib. It's going to cool down. I'll get you there in 20 minutes, okay? It's, it's hot. The, the chef is ching ching. He's got his knife. He's sharpening it up. You're going to have a good meal when you get there. Wings and everything else. But you got to eat this meal first. Because if you eat this meal, it's like the, it's what he said to the woman at the well. Woman! If you're going to come up here looking for water every day, it's a long trek. And you're going to be thirstier faster than you know it. But if you drink from what I'm about to give you. You will never, ever thirst again. And guess what the woman said? I want that water. You see, the church just has to say, Pastor, I want the teaching. Now, you could do whatever. You could take this and say, oh, let me tell you what Pastor said. He didn't know that this word meant this or that. No, I can tell you this. I've lived an extremely blessed life because I have never, ever not cheated the Lord out of a penny. And you know why I know that? Because I don't trust myself. I gave this woman here all authority over everything in our house. And I said, you're much more faithful than me. Make sure that everything that comes into the house, I don't care if it's a million dollars, give it away. Because I want to make sure. You hear what I'm saying to you, church? Do you hear? Like, this is it. Don't store up so many treasures for yourself on earth. Store stuff, stuff up for yourself, right? We've got times that are coming. But it's not your life goal that how comfortable can I be? How big of a house can I do? How much stuff can I put into the, my safety deposit box or whatever? Man, it says, invest it in the kingdom of God. Can you hear what I'm saying, church? Truth. That's all. Truth. It's not the hearer of this word that's going to get the blessing. I'm shutting this off. It's the doer. Stand to your feet with me. I'm not taking up an offering. I don't do that stuff. Pastor Craig is. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Just joking. Not doing that either. Can I tell you this, man? I love you guys so much to tell you the truth. And then to know the truth, and the truth sets you free. And this is long. I mean, here's a, here's a young lady who's just visiting, say, for the first time. She's going, I'm in church for 3 hours and 15 minutes. <laughs> what the heck did I get myself into? You're in a good place. That's what you got yourself into. Because while people are going the wrong way, you're going the right way. And uh, hopefully you fill out a visitor card for me. Um, so I want you to just do this. Come on, just lift your hands to the Lord as I close this prayer. Father, we thank you today. Lord, for the wisdom and the knowledge that you give through your word. Oh, Jesus, it is so liberating to walk in your freedom and in your counsel, Lord. Lord, it is so liberating, Father. Lord, to know truth. And Lord, it's also scary to be obedient to it. And Lord, I ask for boldness today over everyone in this room today, Lord, that they wouldn't just be hearers of this message and going, great word, Pastor, but they would become doers. And, Lord, that they would seek you out and bless you, Father, and bring into the storehouse that which you've entrusted them with, Lord. And so, Father, today I closed my case. And I say, Lord, that it was done according to how you wanted it done. Now, Father, we say let 
let, let, let the chips fall where they may. And uh, Lord, I know that, Lord, this week, um, it'll be the starting week of the challenge. And I pray that your people pass the test. I pray, Lord, that they become the most blessed people on the planet because the, the economy of our God is not the economy of this world. So I say blessings to you all, wisdom and knowledge and honor to each one of you. And I declare over you that trust the Lord, test him and let him prove to you that he is more than able to be the best steward you ever saw over your finances. So Father, we thank you right now that we come against the spirit of fear. We come against the spirit of religion. We come against all lies over this word. And we thank you, Lord, that it's gonna accomplish what it was set forth to do in Jesus' name. And if you agree with this word, shout amen. amen. Hallelujah. God bless you guys.